bring some chairs so you can see us. <laughs> Maybe you could bring yours up here a little bit. So we're kind of in a little horseshoe. Like a circle. Kind of a like a circle, circle, but half a circle. And we have three of us. So, <laughs> uh, well, we do dyads in first grade and in other grades as well. Um, Sometimes we're just communicating um, our feelings that morning, or we might be talking about um, an idea in a book. Um, the topic we're talking about today is uh, our playground equipment. We are buying new playground equipment um, with our PTA, um, in collaboration with PTA. And our question is really, um, how are we going to be responsible for taking care of it? Uh, because each year, we, we spend some PTA money, we've got PTA in here too, um, purchasing new equipment. And, oh, hi, Josie, come on up. Josie. <laughs> you can sit right there. I'm going to grab this chair right back. Okay. And um, it's important for us to be thinking about our Eagle Code and how we're responsible with our playground equipment so that it will last uh, a long time for us. So our goal in doing a dyad is really not to talk about do I agree with your idea or I disagree. It's really just to see if we can understand what our partner is saying because uh, we know that understanding somebody else's point of view can really help us when we are trying to problem solve together. So that's our goal here. Um, I think you and I will partner up. We'll have you two partner up. So before we start talking, girls, um, just reminding you of, of our purpose. That's one of our critical thinking elements that um, why do we need to be responsible with our equipment is our question that we're trying to answer today. Um, point of view, we want to think about our first grade point of view, but also um, who else might be out on the playground? Who else is out on the playground besides first graders? Big kids. Yeah. Big, big kids, yeah. yeah. Anybody else on the playground? Um, the other, the other um, first grade class. The first grade class, sure. Anybody else? And adults. Adults are out there. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about um, where the money comes from to purchase this. That would be another point of view to think about is our PTA um, and their part in this. We know that when we're done listening to our partner, we're going to try to repeat back what we heard our partner say. So again, we're not trying to, to agree or disagree. We're really, um, our purpose is to try to understand our partner and repeat back what we heard they say. And we can ask, um, did I hear you accurately? Or if we need something clarified, um, we can use our critical thinking standards to ask, you know, um, can you clarify this part for me? Um, our partner can also ask, you know, was I clear? explaining um, my perspective. So, girls, are you ready to chat? Mm -hmm. Essie, could you be partner A? And Josie, can you be partner A? So partner A is going to do the talking first. Partner B, remember, we're just going to listen. Kenley's super good at this. She was doing it earlier today. Um, and then we'll see if we can restate what our partner said. Girls, what do you think we need to do to be responsible for playground equipment? Um, yeah, I, think, I think that. I you can start talking to Kelly too. <laughs> you um, can like squeeze the balls like really hard or also pop or something like that. Be flat and, um, to wait a minute and give her some time in case there's anything else because I don't want to interrupt her thinking. Do you want Essie to clarify what she said or repeat? 
need anything clarified, can we? Do you feel like you understood what she said? So at this point, if we were doing this whole group, then we would have the students share out loud to the whole class what their partner said. So again, not their own idea, but making sure that they were um, practicing those listening skills and really understanding their, their partner's point of view. So, so that is what we've been working on a little bit in first grade. Um, and we'll keep practicing that. Hi, Ethan. Hi. Welcome. <laughs>
Um, a family can also fill out a choice enrollment application to attend a school outside of their like home attendance boundary um, through the school choice process. Families can also request to attend a school in another school district um, outside of the school district where they live. So for choice enrollment, every school district must um, adopt policies and procedures to implement the provisions of our school of choice, um, public school of choice laws. In addition, we must ensure that our policies and procedures follow federal law, ADA, um, and IDEA, and anti discriminatory discrimination laws for protected students. Moreover, the Colorado Department of Education has recently made changes to regulations governing the school of choice process for students with disabilities to require an anonymous application review process. So, JFBA, JFBAR. This policy is for students living in TSD attendance areas. And one of the big shifts you'll see is we have one for in and one for out because there's a bit of nuance and differences between both policies and that is a big change that we are having today. These students by law receive priority over non-resident students per state law so we must accept them first so that's one of the reasons why we have two enrollment periods. Students will now be able to file a single application for each school of choice rather than individual applications like they had to before. Um, for each school, streamlining that process significantly. And all of our regulations have been updated to reflect laws impacting the entire school of choice process. One major change is the move from two choice enrollments, like I said, to one for current TSD students. So this open room policy is for non-resident students living outside of TSD's attendance area. Applications for these students are processed after resident TSD students get priority in their choice schools. These students will also be able to file a single application for each school of choice rather than individual applications for each school, so that is streamlined. And for these applications, will need to be filled out yearly for these students because we always need to priority our resident students first. Okay. So school choice, school policy JHD and its exhibit have been consolidated inside of the school of choice and open enrollment denial processes. Therefore, you will see them redlined without a revised policy edition. And you will also notice they were extremely outdated. Last updated um, October 1993. Let's think about where we were in October 1993. No. Yeah, not a person. Yep. There we go. <laughs> Okay, and since then that a policy has been eliminated from CASPI. So, that's a broad overview and I know there will be some questions over that, but does the Board of Education have any questions about Choice Enrollment Policy JFBA or Open Enrollment Policy JFBE? Okay, let's go ahead and Alexandra's eating, so we'll start over here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, actually, I do have a question and, and Melissa, I did send my question to you about the wording. If you put up the slide that says choice enrollment JFBA slash JFBAR, yeah, the third bullet. I, I read this over and over again and I see no difference in the two options that are presented. Students will now be able to file a single application for each school rather than individual applications for each school. It sounds like the same thing with just um, a couple of different adjectives. And so I, I'm interested in an explanation from one of you, some of you, as to what the difference is between a single application for each school and an individual application for each school. Okay. so. Now I get your question. <laughs> I think we were thinking you were comparing this statement with the other policy because they both no. mean you are saying the statement's funky as it was written and you have a great suggestion for the new wording. So what we were trying to say is that um, so currently students, families need to fill out an application for this school and this school and this school and this school and now there's one application and then they're going to prioritize four different choices by priority uh -huh. up to four. 
So, yes. So, okay. I'm glad you... So, changing the wording was your suggestion to make yes. that more clear. And yes. you think that what I suggested perhaps does make it yes. more clear? Yes. Okay. I, I probably read this ten times, and I thought, <laughs> yes, I just it don't is, see the difference. We went from the two. bullets are similar on JFBA and JFBB, and we're like, well, that's for in-school or, or in-district yes. and for out-of-district, so yeah. thank you for clarifying yeah. what your yeah. question yeah. Your was. Your suggestion <laughs> for learning is spot on. Love it. <laughs> now that we know. No, yes, we know that, that yeah. helps. So what will be the, the wording? This is just for you. Right, that's um, what I so, thought. So, so yes, so okay, this so is you'll just have something that's clear for the parents. Exactly. Thank you. So okay. they get to pick inside of when they are online with the, they go through uh, Scribbles is the program we use. They will get to pick it at high school level, let's say Loveland High is their first choice, then they could pick Thompson Valley as their second choice, Mountain View as their third choice, et cetera. So they just get to click and prioritize what they would prefer to go to, where they would prefer to go. Any other questions, Stu? No. Denise? No I questions. Can calm down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great suggestion. Done? Um, I would just say that um, it's really long. It's overwhelming how long they are. And I, and, and I understand, I mean, I understand that it's reflecting what everybody else has, at, but it, it's probably one of our longest policies now. <laughs> and so that struck me, especially since what five pages of it is definitions. Um, if there's any way to reformat just for like pulling out terms versus what needs to be in the policy, that would be awesome because I was completely overwhelmed by just the sheer size of it. And yet what's changing makes so much sense and it's much simpler than what's actually all the words that we have just to make sure that it's official so um but otherwise i love the change itself i love that it's streamlined and um i think the other thing that struck me is <coughs> and i'm of course trying to remember back to the last time i looked at the policy so forgive me if i've got it wrong but um there was sort of a, a way that we had worded it in the past that like once you came into the district you're now a district student and now we're saying that if you're out of district if you say live in I don't know on the other side of the street in Fort Collins that you're gonna have to reapply every year to stay up your seat and I wonder if that's gonna be a challenge for some people and I think as long as we're proactive in communicating that so that people don't miss that window and show up because we literally just had this conversation with our staff here about how people show up on the first day of school because I didn't know I had to register to be in kindergarten. And it's not limited to kindergarten. So if we can just save ourselves from the fallout of that, that would be helpful. Alexander, any questions? I agree with the link thing. I mean, it went from one policy that was five pages to two policies that are 20 pages each. So it was eight fold <laughs> longer than it used to be. Um, and I was trying to read through like very carefully and it was, it's, it's a lot. Um, so I, I agree. I don't know if there's any way to deal with that. D are the, is it required like from CASB are all these definitions and all this like very, very intricate detail? Is that required to be in there? I'll throw that to Colin. Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to say. So, um, apologies for the link. Um, <laughs> clarity and conciseness, competing goals. Mm -hmm. um, so, no, it's not required by CASB. Um, but at the same, so the goal is to be very clear with parents and very upfront. Like, that is complete transparency is the goal um, to save ourselves headed down the road. So, we don't need all the definitions, but I also would say we're kind of wrapping in a lot more concepts than just normal choice enrollment, right? Like, our rules for moving students with disabilities are exceptionally thorough under federal law, and we're trying to, like, distill them down and make them understandable in the policy without leaving things open and confusing parents, but we can certainly pare it down. Um, it's not required. So, so I don't know. I mean, it, but yeah. I don't know either. I mean, to be honest, as I threw that out there, I'm not saying we should do that, but I also think maybe right yeah and then the other question I had is where it talks about which I don't disagree with this but talks about that 
you know, there should be the anonymous applications, but then it also talks about that the school will not make alterations or introduce new programs. So what if a child with disabilities applies for a school, gets accepted, and then that school can't meet their needs? What happens then? So CDE, that is the exact new regulation that came out. Um, it's a very long site, I'm not going to read it. Um, but it's uh, at the very end of CDE's regulations, they just tacked it on in subsection one of the regs. And so what they have outlined as the policy requirement is that students apply, all students apply anonymously. Um, so we can't know who any students are. There's no risk of, I don't want to take this student because they have a disability, so they're all anonymous. Um, we offer seats out on a seat availability space basis. And then they get an offer of admission, they accept it. At that time, then the student becomes not anonymous. Um, and if there is an IEP or a 504 that cannot be implemented in that building, then that team must meet in the building to, to, to make that determination. The only team that is qualified under federal law to determine if a student can receive free and appropriate public ed is that team. So they have said they must be offered a seat, and then if they are not able to get faith there, um, that then they are offered, they will be offered a different seat within the choice enrollment program, however schools want to do that. We've done that by saying, here are the open, s the schools with available seats where you can get a free appropriate public ed, would you like one of those? That seems like the easiest way to work with parents um, and to kind of maximize where they would have said they wanted to go had they known that they couldn't get it there. Right. If that makes sense. It does, but it seems like that could be a source of frustration to parents certainly too, if they're like, oh, I really want to go to the school, and then they get a notification that they get in, and then they're like, oh, no, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know that there's a, another way to do it. I don't know. If they, I mean, it sounds like there's not. And I like I like what you said about that. And like, you know, sorry, you can't come here, but we can go go here, 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 and then giving them another another choice. Yeah. In most situations, like all of our high schools have all of the programs, mm -hmm. and okay. many of the middle schools have many of the programs. Okay. Elementary, we have a few that have specialized programs and so we would never say you you shouldn't apply for school of choice but like it, educating our parents to know where we have programs and options um, is always like we have done that before like a parent has said I am looking for a couple of different options what other school has these programs and we are happy to give them that information <coughs> at the time. You know, our main goal is to be able to offer services um, in all of our spaces for, and using the IEP process to see how can we design the, especially if there's space. Yeah. yeah. So parents have to have this whole packet or can it not be? Oh, no, ma'am. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, that's what I thought and I was listening yes. to what they said yes. and I'm going, this is it way too much and yeah. this is <laughs> yeah. and, and the online application is very much so sectioned okay. out and how they apply. Yeah. It, okay. it is not any of this. Now we would have it obviously in our board available. documents and of it's course. available to them if they have any questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I just wanted to clarify yeah. that because as they were talking, I'm thinking, yeah, it's a lot there. One thing that we might think about, um, given the length of this policy, is maybe shifting the definitions to an exhibit. Mm -hmm. And that way the policy yeah. becomes much shorter and cogent. Mm -hmm. um, and so that might kind of, I think having definitions provide clarity and, um, and some that level of detail typically. Um, I'm just wondering if we've had definitions and policies before to me, those, those seem better placed in exhibits maybe to think about. And so what about the what you were mentioning about schools that have these certain programs, especially elementary, is that written down anywhere so that if parents need to see which schools offer a certain program that fits the student, is it there somewhere? Or is it not? Or can we not put it in print? Yeah. Well, also there's like all kinds of different programs. Well, yeah, right? absolutely. So school of Choice is for programs um, there's TOL, there are um, IB programs, mm -hmm. so yes, like definitely making sure that um, all of our families know all of the beautiful options that we have in all those schools. Now they still need to apply for that particular program mm -hmm. um, and then apply for that school of choice, but yes, I think really um, making sure that people are really aware, both inside and outside of our school district, all the things that we can offer is important 
and then I would say, like for our our special education populations and our coordinators, um, really just being able to um, continue to educate our um, families on what programs are there, and you know, some we might add another program. So it's not always that they would always just be three or four. So it's, but. I absolutely agree that we need to make sure that all of our families know <coughs> how to access um, the programming that your child needs and which schools they can offer right before. Okay. It's you. definitely about communication. Barb, I have a question. Okay. Uh, let's Go ahead. Okay. Um, and it's possible that Dr. Schaefer's suggestion is going to address the same thing that I'm going to ask you. Um, is it possible, based on what Alexandra and Don um, referenced, that these policies could have an executive summary for the benefit of the parents. And as I said, it, that may be kind of what he's suggesting through the regulation so that they they can get the essence of the policy and then still they or someone can help them understand the policy itself. Is that a possibility? Sure. And I definitely think we need to make and definitely tap into um, our communication on a parent friendly putting it all out there uh -huh. of this is how we do it right. and a, a, a all stakeholder friendly so mm -hmm. our principals our front office staff really can say here's our bottom line you know we had we had six slides that's really short for me so six <laughs> slides to demonstrate this whole thing I know we can just make it much more mm -hmm. here's yeah because we want to make sure especially the first that everybody knows how to apply for their choice. All right, that, that's very, very I have one Don. more. Okay. Um, charter schools. So does the law apply to them? And then does our policy apply to them? Yes and yes. Yes. Cool. Thanks. Okay. Good to know. All right. Um, anybody else? All right. 4.2. First reading policy JFBB. I think we did the first four, right? Did we? They're all four. I don't. We have to. But so when it comes time for two weeks from tomorrow well, night, um, there might be questions that will pop up. So just yeah. okay. So four point five retirement of the policies. Do we need to go through those two um, of JHD? We are redlining all of them. Uh -huh. So that's they just are all we need to have everybody be aware of. That's, that's correct. It. Yes. Okay. All right. Unless there are questions around it. Cool. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify. Yeah. yeah. All of that mm -hmm. accomplished in just a few minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Four point seven is the district unified improvement plan. Let me guess. Who's here? Yeah. <laughs>
So our DUIP um, goes with the Education Accountability Act. Thank you. Thank you. Um, of 2009, and it requires us to do this um, each year. So our intent behind that is, uh, as Melissa said, she presented you with our district performance framework last board session and um, showed you all of our scores and was able to give you all of our data. With that data, we dissect all of it as a district as well as each school doing the same thing as they are writing their school unified improvement plans right now and really walking through where are our areas where we are not meeting performance at this point and where do we really have to drill down and set goals for ourselves or major improvement strategies and moving forward over the next couple of years. And so it's in these four areas that we really evaluate everything. So we uh, look at all of the data, we write priorities based on that student data. Uh, we actually met in our continuous improvement teams over the last couple of days and each principal brought their ILT um, to that meeting and um, have been writing their plans together. Everyone receives um, feedback. We met as a, um, in DAC last week um, and got parent stakeholder engagement um, and ideas and each school will also have a SAC meeting and walk through and get ideas from that parent committee as well as they're writing these plans. Then we evaluate everything, we write major improvement strategies and really walk through what that implementation process looks like um, over the next couple of years. As I was saying, we write these in two year increments and so the idea behind it is you kind of backwards plan, where do you hope to be two years from now? at the end of this coming year, and then where are we starting from?
achievement is not at the 50th percentile, it's much lower, but they are approaching in some categories very close to that 50th percentile, and that is a sweet spot because that means that you are going to make a year's worth of growth. So we want that, and then we want it more. Uh, culture and climate goal. We have a culture and climate goal based on our panorama survey data. So uh, by, and that survey is about to go out here in the next few weeks, but each elementary and secondary student groups will report at a 75% or 45% respectively, a favorable rating on the panorama student survey that they have a sense of belonging. And so you might ask, well, why just 75% or why just 45%? But those numbers represent like about a 20 percentage point increase to what they reported last year. And so if we can get there, we can ratchet it up even higher. Um, but we would like to, to definitely see our students be reporting that we're working very hard on sense of belonging district-wide. And elementary, yes, thank you. Um, being reminded that elementary is only third through fifth grade. So we do not mm -hmm. test kids in this All right, so the, the next category you would see on our Unified Improvement Plan, uh, student performance priority. So academic is just another way of saying this more granular. This plan continues to get more and more granular. Um, as I was explaining to you, multilingual learners and students with disabilities, the reason why is because they are actually below that 50th percentile in the, um, the academic growth. And if we can get them there, their achievement is going to start ratcheting it up. I want to share a, a a brief conversation that I had with uh, one of our DAC participants because they were really getting into it. We're actually going to bring it back to DAC this next time. They were wondering what does that growth score mean? What does that academic score mean? And they were really noticing it with students with disabilities and multilingual learners. And one of them had this aha moment like, well, this isn't good. And I said, no, it's not. Like that's why we have to make this a goal. And so they were they were writing down on sticky notes and we got a lot of great feedback from them. So we want to definitely see these uh, uh, two disaggregated groups make some huge improvements. Um, and as I just mentioned, the sense of belonging piece, as we have studied foundationally, if we can increase the student sense of belonging it is going to help with academics as well. We have to have students feeling good and welcome in their classrooms. Also on our DUIP, it asks us why we think we actually have the issues that we do. So we sit together and we do a root cause analysis. And um, even though the students that we are identifying, they have consistently not met grade level expectations, when we go around and around, and I've saved slide space by not putting all this on there, a root cause analysis continues to ask the question, why, well, why this, why this, why this? And one of the conjectures we have is not all students, we want each and every student in Thompson School District to have access to a culturally responsive and um, inclusive tier one instructional experience. They all get it a great experience that first time that they're being taught something before we jump to interventions and things like that. Um, same thing with our, our root cause, our culture and climate root cause. We've We've not yet streamlined and quality controlled our um, social emotional learning pieces or what we want to see and actually warm welcomes in classrooms, the adult, the trust adult or relationships in buildings and being able to actually have that across the district instead of um, an opt-in type of situation. We want every single student to have a, a warm and welcoming school. So honestly, the root causes for both is just to be able to provide tier one guaranteed experience for uh, for our kids at each and every one of our buildings. So I, while I won't read these to you, um, it, I know you're seeing the same thing. It sounds like the same thing, but it is incrementally a little bit different the way we have to actually put it into these cells in our DUIP, uh, but we name uh, best first instruction. So we are gonna, be looking at our service delivery models for our multilingual learners and for our uh, students with disabilities. There are many different service delivery models and are we using the best ones to get the results? Strategies such as co-teaching, um, uh, the different teams that we have on our special education teaching teams that serve buildings, are we actually you know, efficiently utilizing them and are they delivering in a way that actually is the best model for the kids? So using some research behind that as well. Um, and our Continuous improvement teams, which I believe um, Carrie mentioned uh, previously, 
are our building leadership teams that are really working on that sense of belonging at our schools. So being able to actually have school-wide teams train the trainer models with restorative practices as kind of a root of our philosophy, we're going to hit this one too. So that's, these are our two major improvement strategies. And last week, you heard a little from me, uh, kind of like the now what moving forward. So our academic plan, we have a lot of great things going on. We have great professional development. We have great instructional tours that actually walk through buildings, uh, teams of directors, um, principals with uh, myself and Dr. Schaefer, as well as uh, their executive directors to actually walk through and see how tier one instructional practices are doing on a regular basis. Our professional learning committee uh, communities, which are at the center of that triangle I showed you last time, those are meeting regularly, weekly, at every single uh, building to discuss students. Um, we have had some great math professional development as of late, and I can assure you that uh, just in walking through some high schools lately, Dr. Schaefer and I have seen math that we've never seen before in our high schools. It's really been amazing. The teachers are just uh, fired up over it. It's really wonderful. Um, our culture and climate plan, um, we have a train the trainer model with all of our social emotional learning specialists that are in our buildings that become trained trainers for culturally responsive restorative practices. So they, are, they can train other teachers, they can coach other teachers and provide help and assistance with those um, approaches. And uh, just being able to increase our student engagement through student voice. We want to include our students on the big decisions that our district and our schools are making. And so wanting to make an intentional effort to um, naming that students are important and that your opinion matters. So those are our implementation and action plans kind of just at a glance. Does the board have any questions about our district unified improvement plan? And school unified improvement plans will follow that same format. Okay, we'll start with Denise. Oh, sorry, I'm too in your mouth. <laughs> And so timeline for the, this to be the final <coughs> and then in October with the school versions, then yeah. they're all, all due October, October 15th. 15th. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amy? Just wondering about the, I don't know if you can answer this, but the panorama survey. Mm -hmm. Is the question about a trusted adult worded so that it's not necessarily a teacher, but could it be like a nutrition aide? Could it be a para? Could it be, because I think that a lot of times when we think of a trusted adult, we think it's a teacher. I mean, it could be the crossing guard. It could be. Um, I believe so. And so I can actually look at this. Yeah, he's sitting behind me. Yes. It said it doesn't sort of steer students towards a just a teacher. Okay. I think it's literally a trusted adult written in those yeah. words. Okay. Curious about how, if it was the wording that was affecting affecting the scores or not. Yeah. So, okay. that's all. Don, uh, I love that this is streamlined. It's really really great, especially for all the different student or school plans. Um, wanted to mention that for schools that have a pie, um, that's where you're gonna see your SUIP, right? Um, and it doesn't always mean that you're like actually looking at the piece of paper. Mm -hmm. It could be that you're giving feedback on what's the biggest priorities in our school this year, mm -hmm. right? I had some people ask me that after oh, um, from DAC. DAC. Yes. And so I was like, gotcha. I bet you did it. And they were like, yes, that is what it sounded like. I was like, great, okay. It's not always gonna be exactly right. the model you just did. Yep. Um, but that doesn't mean that you didn't do it. Yep. Um, I am especially glad to see this level because you and I were talking at DAC about um, how I feel like some adults get real hung up on like we're going to improve our test scores for this group of students and that it gets conflated with like how we're actually going to do it. So to see that where we're putting the energy to make sure that happened is in the things that we know work, right? The universal um, and the culturally responsive practices, I, I'm very excited because I think even last week we didn't have yet that 
this level of detail and those are the really the right ways mm -hmm. that we're gonna get there is by supporting the students that we actually have and not just saying hey you guys need to get to your 50th percentile just do that because just doing it isn't gonna get us there right and we've been doing a bunch of things this is the group that is still like not seeing the gains that some of the other groups have which I think is the beauty of universal design. <laughs> like I know you and I have talked about it all the time, right? Is that if we teach for the students to struggle the most, everybody gets better. Instead of what's normal, which is that we teach to the students who get it fastest and easiest, and then we're like, what? <coughs> everybody else didn't just get it? And so I'm very excited that we're moving that forward even more and having the focus be on really helping the students who need it the, the most because then everybody's going to get better. Thank you. So thanks. Alexandra? Um, <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of questions. One is just when in doing the, are there, in submitting this to the state, is it required that there are like two areas and one is academic and one's not or what are the, what are the requirements for that? done that ourselves. We did that this year ourselves. We chose a, a culture and climate as well as an academic priority. They don't encourage more than three per year just because <coughs> to really effectively improve and, and get those strategies and goals to come to fruition. It's we don't want more than three. Okay. So some schools will choose two academic and one culture and climate, etc. But we won't have more than three per per building. Okay. We have asked each school to have one of each and one of the ways that we embedded kind of more than one academic area in our academic goal is to have it for both math and English language oh, arts okay. yeah. and with two, and two groups mm -hmm. yeah. yes so it's actually four <laughs> in a little bit yeah. okay and then my other question was about and related to the panorama survey you say on there that the goal is to have this improvement by May 1st of 2025 but the panorama survey is happening soon we'll have the results sooner than that right so is there is there any way like there's only been a very limited amount of time to implement these strategies yes. by the time the panorama survey goes out is there a way to like recheck in the spring? So I know we talked a long time ago about There are interim benchmarks that we yes. put in place. And okay. so again, we're writing this for two years. Okay. So in two years <coughs> from now, you know, that, that goal, we have one and then hopefully we'll extend even better depending on what those percentages are. And then there's also a component in there called interim benchmarks. And so we could use um, additional data because again, more than one data point is important. Our main data point will be the panorama survey. However, um, schools can use things like Bloom sites or um, any other survey data that they're actually giving out to students um, at that point in time. Some are choosing to chunk out portions of maybe just the sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. So the questions like, um, are, are students, d does a student have a person you know, a trusted adult that they have. They could be surveying just that question maybe twice per year. Okay. And they're getting interim benchmarks with the overall um, piece being the panorama survey data each year. Okay. So there are multiple different options of being able to do that throughout and the plan gives that flexibility for it. Okay. And one more thing, I'm so sorry. Um, we can actually pull out just a sense of belonging and um, resurvey all students in the spring so we can look at the consistency from fall to spring. Oh, okay. they will. And then other schools will be doing this, like she said. Okay, yes. Great question. Okay. Um, it's nice to see what we did last week and that kind of fall into place. And yeah, so it was done well. Stu? Okay. Yes. Um, you don't have to go back to the first slide, but I want to read part of a sentence from the first slide. Ensure all students exit the K-12 education system. Are we a K-12 education system or are we a pre-K-12 education system? That's the first part of my question. And then secondly, if we are pre-K-12, how does your um, report tonight impact the littles? Perfect. So pre-K does not need to write a unified improvement plan. And okay. so that's why per the state policy, that statute comes right off of CBE's website. Mm -hmm.
and so it's only kindergarten through 12. Okay. Our pre-K system, they actually were a part of the CI teams today, and okay. they are federally funded in a different way and have to um, put together plans and submit those for an entirely different area. So they actually worked on those plans today while K-12 buildings were working on their unified improvement plan. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Anybody else have anything more? All right, thank you. All right, 4.8 is first reading policy FEB, architect, engineer, <coughs> construction manager. Hi, Todd. Hi, Barb. Good evening, Madam President, and Board of Education, Dr. Schaefer, Todd Laconi, Assistant Superintendent of Operations. So similar to the last uh, presentation on policies, there's actually three different um, um, titles here, but we'll do it under one presentation. Okay. So it'll be FEB, FEG, and FEGB. Um, on all three of the policies, there's, I would say, minor updates um, addressing the state statute, and then uh, practices that we've learned over the last several years since they've been updated last. So I'll go through each and just uh, highlight um, the summary of what is being adjusted or proposed to be adjusted. Uh, on FEB, Architect, Engineer, Construction Manager, it's addressing all firms uh, instead of just singular architects. Um, updating the contract documents, so our policy actually referred to an old set of contracts that we've not used, so we actually use our uh, contracts that are um, done by Captain Ernest, and then updating the governing authority at the state level. So pretty, um, again, simple updates, but those are the summary really of the main points. When you look at uh, FEG, construction and contracts, biddings and awards, um, delivery methods clarified versus general approaches. So the policy as we were looking and talking to the legal counsel, um, it defines oh, more about approaches. Oh, did I not? Or, uh, the delivery method, um, this is it's clarified more than just general approaches. So it actually goes in a little more depth of the different approaches. Uh, professional services, it's updated to reflect um, industry norms. So we had some that were previously there, and then we added to them to just clarify a more extensive list of actually what that means. Um, and then there was just some, you'll see some, uh, I'll call it just errors that we needed to fix up that um, have been there for a while, so. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't necessarily report that. <laughs> There's probably still some, Stu, I don't know. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. <laughs> we know that's your role. Yeah. That and then, uh, one of my roles. Yeah. 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 FEGB is uh, we're required to bond. We're required to bond contractors. Um, we just need to update the bonding amount. So it's currently fifty thousand. So that's just a state statute to say bonding requirements are updated on these contracts at fifty thousand or more. So that is a quick review of the three policies. Uh, that we'll come back then uh, next time for approval. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? When, when was were they last updated? You know? I do. Just out of curiosity. It was, it was a couple of 18. Uh, last 2018? 2018, and then almost one was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't have the 90s in here. Okay, was, I guess that was my main question. I, yeah, I think 08 was the other one. Okay. Not, not 1918, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, <laughs> yeah, just to clarify, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was 2005. Sure. Thank you for not making them 20 pages. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Don, did you have anything? Okay, I didn't either. All right. Thank you. And now you stay also because where are we? we are on the Loudoun oh. Ditch Water Share contract. Yes. Thank you again, Madam President. Um, just a little background on a contract that's for approval next time. Uh, these shares were previously uh, approved by the board to be surplus. So, to recall, we sold the uh, finally sold the 96 acres of land. Uh, we had water shares tied to this, so they're surplus because you don't have the land. Uh, therefore, we have water shares that we can't uh, use. So, 
these were placed on open market uh, after approval. And then we did get a uh, contract um, with Russell Baker as the buyer for 125000 for the 2.5 shares of Loudon Pitch, which is on the north side of the district. So um, the contract and the purchase sale agreement was uh, reviewed by legal counsel on both sides. Um, after a process, that's what will be for approval, um, or recommended for approval for the next board meeting. Okay, cool. Questions? Don? No. Yeah, 
So you all have a copy of <coughs> the um, legislative platform. And some of you may be thinking, it looks different than it did when Stu sent something to Laura Lee and just asked her to run it off. So uh, after we adopted this uh, at our sep September 18th meeting, I contacted Dr. Schaefer and I said, um, what, what's been submitted looks like something that was formatted by an English teacher as a piece of expository writing, which is what it was. Mm -hmm. I said, can we do something to jazz this up? <laughs> and so he turned it over to Mike, and this is what we have. This is, this is one of the two looks uh, that it has. Uh, the second look is uh, in development at this point. When I went to the CASB uh, Winter Conference in January, um, I also picked up one that had more of a, a magazine layout. It was only one piece of paper, but rather than being stapled at the top, it was like a, a 9 by 16 piece of paper that was folded in the middle. And so we're also going to um, present this same information uh, in another format and something that uh, when we go to conferences and so on, we can, we can take this along. Most of what we've seen so far uh, is stapled pages from other school districts without photos and so on. Uh, and again, I want to thank Mike because when he sent this to me initially, I thought, wow, I knew it was going to look different. I didn't really expect it to look like this. And so uh, thanks to him for this. And we'll look forward to having this, uh, to have the other format for you to look at as well. In terms of a CASB report. Uh, about all I can tell you is that, as you know, the legislative session will begin after the first of the year, and I'll be attending the fall conference, uh, which will be in two weeks in Pueblo. Uh, I know. <laughs> you want to come along? <laughs> and so, um, I'll hopefully be able to bring back some more information to you about um, pending legislation and, and things like that. So uh, that's my report, Madam okay. President. Thank you. Yeah. Keep um, representing us. Yes, yeah. keep doing it. I am going to ask that we take a few minutes to get up and move around. And there's cupcakes here, so if you want a cupcake, anybody wants a cupcake? Okay. <laughs> we are ready to begin our discussion item <coughs> 6.1, which is graduation requirements. Yes. I was somewhere, we were at um, Loveland High School and they asked us, uh, we were uh, visiting the cadet program this well. awesome. morning. <coughs> and there were four of us. Yeah, the no. three of us and Don were there. And there were 19 <coughs> or 20 kids in that group. Yeah, it, was, it was good. Wow. And one of them asked about items on the agenda and the graduation requirements, and so they wanted to know about it. How'd that end up on the agenda? And I said, well, because it was something we were interested in, so yeah. timely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it, 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 act, we are grateful for that, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Schaefer. Um, tonight's presentation with members of my team here, I'll introduce them in a minute. Uh, this is a topic that you all brought forward as something you wanted to study. So we thank you that opportunity because in doing so we were able to find out very interesting data and being able to discuss it with each other and, and share it with you and being able to frame our questions for you tonight to get your input over what it is that we do here in Thompson School District for graduation requirements. So uh, to my right I have Mr. Theo Robeson who is Executive Director of Secondary Education. Um, we have Mr. Andy Stevens who is our Director of College and Career Readiness and uh, Ms. Tiffany Jones, Director of Curriculum Instruction, and together they uh, put their heads together around requirements, uh, credits, pathways, and all of that. So I'm going to let them take it away and engage you in this topic tonight. All right. So, greeting, Madam President, Dr. Schaefer, members of the board, Theo Robeson, Executive Director, Secondary Education for Thompson School District, and enthusiastic about having this conversation tonight. Some, some education around how we got to where we're at today. So, 
So our Strive 2025 connections are focused on student achievement and then inclusive and supportive culture. Within that, we want to we want our students to graduate to make sure that they're prepared academically and socially in order to enter their post-secondary opportunities. So what we plan to do tonight is go through the history behind the TSD graduation guidelines and then also to talk about what are some of the current graduation guidelines and then what we'd like to consider for the future, which will be an activity that's led by Andy Stevens and Tiffany. So when we think about the history of our graduation requirements, so in 2013, the Colorado Department of Education brought forward new guidelines to be enacted for the class of 2020. This incorporated civics being a requirement and then also some competency menu of options for math, reading, and writing, and communications. And then so one of the things that we recently learned is that CDE no longer maintains a minimum threshold for credits. Previously, it used to be 17. But as of recently, we've learned that they've changed that, so they no longer have that. So previously in our time here in Thompson School District, we had a committee which was uh, basically brought together by a variety of different stakeholders in 2013. These stakeholders included board members, uh, teachers, principals, students, and so that Thompson Delight was created in order to help us to look at what the new state graduation requirements are and to try to build that pathway throughout our system into a policy. And so then in 2018 is when they concluded their work. And in 2023, CDE uh, implemented some additional requirements, some additional requirements, which is the unit on Holocaust studies, and then also the 0.5 civics credit to be embedded within that. So in Thompson the Life in 2016, they held monthly meetings, compiled to teachers, counselors, administrators, community leaders, like I said previously, and this was the start of looking at creating a new IKF that followed the new state guidelines for graduation requirements. So the main goal of Thompson and Life was to rethink the graduation requirements in light of the new requirements from the state, which is approved by CDE, and then also through that Thompson to Life group. We also, <laughs> we also implemented a community service hours requirement as a graduation requirement. <coughs> So, as of what I shared so far, we'd like to take some time to ask the board members if they have any questions about what they just heard, pertaining specifically to our history of graduation guidelines. Um, Don, do you, wanna, do you have any to start with? I have a question. Well, I just have a question about what you said that there was a civics requirement and then there became a Point five credit civics requirement. What was that? Was that the first one not specify credits, or what was the difference between the two of those? So that's a good question. I don't necessarily have an answer. Tyler Schlegel, our college and career. Yeah. So uh, civics has always been a requirement, but CDE came down and said we want at least a semester of civics. So when we talk about semesters in our system, it's a point five credit. So that's why that point five was there, is because that semester is that point five credit. CDE doesn't necessarily have. I want this much credit for civics. Okay. They just said we want at least a semester of civics. Whereas pre previously they didn't specify. They didn't specify how long, what time period nothing. the class had to be for that okay. civic part. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, the only question I have is we didn't have that little PowerPoint, the little slideshow you went through, and if we could have that because I'm a very visual learner. It's 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 no, it was, but it's not. not. It was when we had our. I was looking at it before, but now yeah. it's not. Yeah. I, 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 I feel no, you have to. The you're going to have to re-log in because I just reloaded it. Oh, okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, we'll find out then. I just want to make sure. I we had to reload. That, 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 that was all yeah. I wanted. Is I wanted to make sure because, like I said, I'm, I just don't hear always everything that that's you're okay. talking about. Oh, that's great. So yeah, that's it. Stu. Um, I have several questions. I think this is a history question. <laughs> All right. Um, why will the 28 credit diploma sunset this year? Yes. So, so one of the things that we've learned is that um, when we put in the 28 credit diploma, we didn't necessarily make a distinction between that and what the level of rigor needed to be. And so then what we've learned from a 24 credit of distinction is that kids could go through the 24 credit diploma and actually because of the concurrent enrollment courses and because of the AP courses might have a more rigorous journey.
but then less time to do a 28 credit diploma <coughs> because they're taking these more rigorous course offerings where you could have a 28 credit diploma that we previously called distinction and never go through such a rigorous journey. So therefore, it looked kind of, a, in, I don't always want to say inequitable, but it almost looked inequitable to have a 24 credit and a 28, where that 24 would actually put kids on a more rigorous track okay. based on their course selections. And my other question that I think is historical deals with the unit of Holocaust studies. I wasn't aware that we taught a unit of Holocaust studies. So that's recent as of 2023, and it's recently been implemented in Tiffany Jones. I'm sorry, I caught yeah, you no, first time. My last year we um, had that approved through World History and Geography. We did that progression. I believe we were at Thompson Valley High School when mm -hmm. we brought that forward. Okay. So that unit has to now be embedded um, in that course, and we didn't have that naturally. And so that's where the teachers came together and developed that unit together. So that will be taught at all of the district high schools? Yes. Uh, and it's required then? It is. State statute. Because that's a required course. Correct. Okay. It's a required unit of study. Within the World within History a, course? Correct. Within World History and Geography course. So if, I'm trying to how, figure out how to ask this question. So do all students not take History and Geography? They do. They do. Okay. I don't need to ask the follow-up question then. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Okay. okay. All right. So we're good. So thank moving you. on. <laughs> Hang on just one second. Okay. Well, we're good. Well, she's doing that. Who, who else did Thompson to like? Anybody else? So I know I, when I came in, it was towards the end of that, mm -hmm. and I inherited that, and Tyler Schlegel kind of helped me understand the background and history pertaining to that. And I know when I was on that, that last, my first year, I remember that uh, Dr. Laura Fizz Award was on there, and Pam Power were also on that committee. Uh, so I do remember some of the people that were part of some of these conversations. Yeah, it's not on my yet. some time and look through that. 
and then also we also placed in here our graduation requirements as well for you to see. And then this is another opportunity for you to ask some questions. So. Give us a second. implemented the 
work keys assessment. So we had a work group of counselors and teachers and principals. Mm -hmm. This was probably like 19, 2019, I want to say. And so within that work group, we looked at this menu of options and we said, so if there was one thing that we wanted to ensure every student had access to right away in order to show they met the competency, we made that decision to be the ACT work keys. But then from there, we also know that students, when you take an AP class, you take a concurrent enrollment class, you take IP classes, like you take a, a you also receive a CTE certification, that also gives you your competency measure. Mm -hmm. But we wanted to kind of think forward and say, well, what if we did this work key, say, freshman or sophomore year? That was the theory and practice. But then what happens is that once you start implementing and people get back to work, that idea didn't work out like we thought. Mm -hmm. And so what happens now as students become seniors is that we know that they're either going to meet it through their SAT score, they're going to meet it through whether they took the concurrent enrollment experience and got the appropriate mark, or whether they took an AP class and got the appropriate mark, or a variety of other things that this outlines. All right. So follow-up question to what you just said. So um, let's assume we have a student who um, has accumulated enough credits to graduate, but has not reached the minimum score on whichever one of these measures is available. What what happens? They can't graduate high school. And they don't. They they so don't graduate if they don't also meet one, this requirement. So that is and we correct, hold yeah. to that. Yes, and I'll give you an example of okay. how much we hold to this. Okay. Okay. So so I will tell you. Um, I believe it was last summer we recognized that we had about 12 kids in our system uh -huh. that we had to call back and we asked them to come and take the ACT work keys because to show that they met the competency because <coughs> accidentally the school didn't have those kids do it. So then Tyler and I connected with the school, got with the students, and these students came back to take the assessment. Some people were away in college and then, <laughs> so I'm literally telling you, but they had to figure out a measure that would demonstrate that they made it because we also have to put it into our system. And, uh, Carrie Bartman here could probably explain that better. Or Is there a remediation students? if for a student who say has 22 credits but hasn't reached the minimum <coughs> score there? So Tyler is shaking his head. No, there is no remediation. That student flat out doesn't graduate. I mean, we do, we do the, the capstone, capstone process. Yes, we have capstone class two built out for 12th grade. And so the capstone process, so we, so within this committee of teachers that helped us establish the work keys, the capstone in our system, so ELA teachers built the set of skills that they expect every student to be able to know and be able to do and demonstrate in order also to meet this measure, because that's another piece of artifact that you can use in this uh, competency menu here. And so we met with ELA teachers, they gave us the skills. We also met with the function algebra teachers for 12th grade algebra uh -huh. and they also gave us a game of life which is a competency measure and uh, a list of standards and skills as well that they can incorporate inside these classes to ensure that these students met the expectation but this is the dilemma sometimes like ideally that can work however there we always have some kids in the system that for whatever reason one or two may have not taken one of these measures and we end up finding it out on the back end. We want this process to be 100% more thorough. So what we've done over last year from what we've learned was a fault in the past is that now I have Tyler uh, Schlegel here meeting more regularly and frequently with schools. And I've also uh, worked with our principals to ensure more deeply that this just does not happen. And I believe this last year we probably had another two or three that, that we recognized, but then we tried to get that corrected right away. So you used a word that leads me to, to my next question, and then I am done, Bart. That's okay. Which, so the only students who do a capstone project are the students who have not met the minimum requirement. Yes. They are the only ones who do a capstone. No, project. no, no. Any no. school could take the, any student could take the class. However, those students who haven't met that expectation, they have to have do that it if they want to graduate. Yes, yes, indeed. Okay. Okay. I, I like that so, because it's so providing an opportunity for that student so to graduate. Yes. Okay. Ms. Bartman just made a statement in the back. So yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. We, we did not have any this Thank year you. because we we put a process in place this past year where my team does a grad poll monthly for Tyler and Theo, and so then that that goes to the principals of where each student is at according to graduation requirements as well as where their competencies are, uh -huh. so that we are not having students walk across the stage in May not having completed all okay. of those areas. So we didn't have any of those this year. Okay. We do have some students that have until the, the end of October, they'll do, or I'm sorry, the end of August, they get to complete some classes. They are finishing coursework up and those types of things through the summer that they can still come back and graduate. However, there are not students that are walking across the stage
this round. Okay. You're on, Jim. <laughs> How'd you put that in writing? <laughs> okay, so I want to talk about topics that are going to game the system and then I'll follow along with you know, where we just left yeah. off. So 24 credits, if done strategically, can be done in three years. Uh -huh. Or if you're bringing math credit from middle school, correct? Eight credits a year, so pass everything. Technically, if you took eight credits a year and you passed everything, you can certainly attempt to try to, but we try to make sure that our juniors that have that number of credits take uh, concurrent enrollment courses okay. or take CTE certifications or do other things to keep them in school for their full four years. So it is, I don't remember which meeting we saw like the ascent numbers and the concurrent enrollment numbers. They seem really low to me given like the great number of students we have is, that are seniors that, and these are amazing, amazing programs. Mm -hmm. But how do we get more people to take advantage of them? I mean, this is a cost relief for parents. It's you know getting kids <coughs> really ready for college um, while they're still um, going. And my daughter, as a senior, is sitting. She needs to take an English class, right? and then she's done. And like, what? Her motivation is not great for this entire senior year um, because she only needs to pass this one thing. So, like, 24 credits kind of seems light to me, honestly, um, because you can do it so fast. So uh, this is where I credit our counselors. Like, I will tell well, you, like, our we counselors. We have a building of four brand new counselors last year. Yeah, it was like, it, it was just like we needed a whole do-over year in terms of scheduling and, like, paying attention to this stuff. So, so one thing that I remember when we were finalizing our IKF is that we had conversations about that specific topic. Yeah. And one of the things that I know our counselors were trying to hold very tight and our principals was around the fact that there's so much more that you can do that senior year, even if you met this number of credits. And so those concurrent enrollment opportunities, those ascent opportunities, the CTE programming, but the other part of it is a lot of our kids just love being in school and they want to just be a part of that environment for their full four years. But then so it's 45% we want to feel like they belong there. That number doesn't match up to me. When you say it that way, y'all. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a pretty low yeah. bar. But, yeah. you know, I, I mean, they, maybe it is the social component. Maybe they're athletes. Maybe they're, you know, a it's a club. Point. That's a good point. But I don't see that you know, they're not really they just want to hang out there, honestly. So, you know, something else, and I don't know if we have it in the data packet, but uh, Carrie Bartman's department with Kelly Sane's department put some numbers together for us. and. One of the things we saw is that like we had less than a 1% of our juniors since 2021 graduate with a 20 credit diploma because we really hold tight to this extenuating circumstances that was defined by us in policy, so to speak. But, but so I will tell you like it was surprising to me because like I would have thought that that number would have been bigger based on what you said because we've analyzed it and you certainly can get through your high school journey in three years if you chose to put your head down and do that. But the people in our system, the people that work with our kids on a daily basis, they do an incredible job helping our kids look at their options and help them understand the importance of being a part of that journey. Because as we said on the first slide there, when we said that preparing our students socially as well is also important for us, some part of that social component is being a part of that four year part to high school. And so that's where we look at the whole well-roundedness of a student even though we obviously know we're here to educate students, that social part, kids, our educators, <coughs> our principals, they try to help support that in conversations with our kids. You can see that for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. and I certainly yes. want kids in school, and I want hearing adults working with them to help that experience be a good one. Um, I still feel like 24 is, you know, there's a lot of kids that, that can. And are they ready to move on? Probably not. But with this makes it pretty easy to do so if they come in, um, you know, doing the work. And we know there are lots of kids that won't do the work because they're you know, catching back up and it's the last you know, several years have been weird. Yes. 
Um, but if we get back into a steady state and we're not all home, or, you know, I, I don't know. I, I would like more um, And then now let's talk about the other end. <laughs> the 20 credit diploma, I, I, Mark mentioned once that it's too light. Um, but I do think there are the kids that it's the ideal diploma for, and I would hate mm -hmm. to see it go away. Mm -hmm. If that's it all on the table, um, particularly you know people struggling with foreign language, you know, it certainly most universities want those two years, but not every kid is going to be a good foreign language learner. Um, are the guards? <laughs> or draw, or <laughs> whatever. Um, so having that option and keeping kids in school longer, even with just 20 credits, is important as well because of the social and social piece. So I'm kind of talking both ways there. But having enough flexibility and rigor to be able to get that entire cohort of kids through and ready um, to do what comes next. I understand that. So you're kind of leading us into this other sheet that we have, that we provided in your packet as well. And so, so on this sheet here, what we tried to do was help us. Before we go there, yeah, yeah. let's yeah. go over to Amy. <laughs> when do students okay, start I'm talking? I'm sorry, I have one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead, yeah, go. So, the other piece of whether it be capstone or hastily getting some kids through at the end of the year that probably shouldn't graduate because they weren't in class ever or rarely um, still happens. Um, there's a lot of pressure on teachers to sign off on kids. Having spoken with teachers um, and indignation with a lot of the kids that are put up on the stage. So how do we avoid kind of making it a joke? That no matter what, you're going to graduate. Um, even if you haven't shown up, if you haven't done the work. Um, mastery is great, but there's also part of what being a working person later, you do have to show up. And attendance when you're working is important. And we are demanding very little of kids in terms of attendance if we're just signing off on different things. And I'd be happy to talk to you more about what I've heard, um, but there is a perception among teachers that we're gonna graduate kids, whether they deserve it or not. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, can we go on? Yes, right. I am now done. Okay. Amy. Um, what grade do you students start talking with counselors about their high school plans? Like, I mean, are they going to jam pack? Do, do seventh and eighth graders know that they could possibly be done in three years? No. Okay, so when do they when do they learn that? <laughs> or, uh, you know, yeah, like eleventh grade. To my knowledge, no one's telling people that. Yeah. So I don't want to be. I don't want to say no. like. So I don't think they are. No, 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 no. I meant like when do they start? Like, what grade do? I mean, is it ninth grade that they say here? Here's what you need to graduate. Here, you know, let's plan this out. Or is it seventh grade, eighth? Like, when do? When does that happen? So, each, oh, each so. child is put in on an AYG at 24 credits. So when, when a student enters their freshman year of high school, they're put in at 24 credits. Once students after their sophomore year, we start to see that they might not make that 24 credit threshold. Their junior year, they would get the opportunity to move to a 20 credit diploma with signatures from teachers, counselors, ultimately signed by Theo. And so then that would get put into our infinite campus system that that student would move from a 24 credit diploma to a 20 credit diploma. That is not widely broadcast. It is not something that they start their freshman year with. It's not something that's there on that side of how the diploma piece 
So let, let me correct that a little bit. So I sign off on a lot of these during the senior year. Oh. So because people hold that tight when I get them because they want to ensure that this is a thing towards the end. So typically when I start to see these, they come second semester of a student's senior year. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily see them unless there's an instance where a person's trying to graduate early, which is underneath 1% of our juniors that are trying to graduate early because of some extenuating circumstance. But the majority of the times when I'm receiving these sheets from our building administrators, it comes the second semester, and typically towards the last nine weeks of the senior year is when I start to get a lot of them to sign off because I'm thinking my hand is hurting. I'm getting too many of these things right now. But the thing that I will tell you is that like, um, it's interesting because I think I think I just want to over compliment the people in the buildings because I think they do a phenomenal job helping students understand the opportunities that they have from ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh, and twelfth grade, and and just educating our kids in order to help them see the importance of standing there for the four years to take on some of these other opportunities. I wish I could agree with you, and I'm really sorry I can't. Um, Hold on a minute. Let Amy oh, yeah, were you sorry. finished? Oh. Yeah, but I just, for clarification's sake, a guardian needs to sign off on that, too. It's not just It should be, yes, it is a conversation that takes place with, with everyone there. That just, make, just making sure. Yes, and okay. most of the time, again, they aren't even introduced until that second semester of junior year. And like Theo said, sometimes it's, the, it's senior year, okay. but it's not something that is broadcast at all before then. And when I get them, it's the senior year. Yeah. <laughs> I just yeah. want to make sure I'm, when I get them on my desk, it's typically the senior year, and it's typically that second semester for the last nine months. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I um, learned of it in a counseling meeting end of sophomore year. We have this other option. We're not supposed to talk about it. But there is a 20 credit diploma. So, I mean, it's being introduced sooner in certain cases. So I, mean, I, I, so you know we've had you, you and I have talked like for real about my kids and we have been all over every day, every data point in here, and and I think that you know looking at how we got through COVID and like the and some of the like lasting impacts and what we're bringing back for real and what we're doing in practice every day is is what's really like how do we get the foundation back where we want it to be right and so I hear that in what you're saying um, I'm gonna say that I think oh, oh a big piece of 2019 right before COVID we were talking about and there were some study sessions on equity and grading for high school that gets to everything you were just talking about that pains me because I was like yes and to both because I had a student who got the 20 credit diploma and I'm so glad that he had that because he never ever would have finished the 24. He just wouldn't have. And and so we like we need that. We need it and these numbers tell us how much we need it. I, I, I'm a little bothered by the idea that we're presenting it as something shameful or less than as well because I think that there is a real place for it. We did it on purpose, and we did it to make sure it was meeting a need, and it is legit. And if we are like shamefully bringing it up, that's not the same as intentionally saying this is the best thing for some students. And we talk in so many other presentations on so many other things that we do for our high schoolers about all these different ways that they can be successful, and that we're setting them up for success, and that 20 credit diploma is part of that. And that I think also goes to like that that piece of is this rigorous enough? Um, I, and so I'd like for us to think about as we move forward with this, the embracing what we do and being proud of everything that we choose to bring forward instead of like half-assing everything and then being like, why would we decide to do that, right? And I, I know how many people are touching this. I pushed a little bit on the counseling piece because I'm going through it right now and I'm like, that does not sound like what's happening in my reality. And, um, and frankly, I don't know that it happened with any of my kids. I feel as if they're, like how, like how we're having those conversations in a way that's really deep and rich and meaningful for the student 
to the point that the parent knows about it <laughs> is a real opportunity. And I know what I just said there is the whole thing, right? But, and by the way, my daughter has a great relationship with her counselor. She was his counseling aide. She sees him every day. So like, we're talking like as good as it gets. And I still feel like, she was like, did you know I could graduate next year? And she's excited about that. She's proud of that. And I think that is something we should tap into along with that thing of like, how do you extend your senior year? And that felt like it wasn't as strong as I wanted it to be from me not jumping in and, and doing it, right? So as we look at all of this, I'd love to see equity grading being how we address the rigor and being proud of our 20 credit diploma. And I'd like, I'm gonna fight fiercely for us to keep that and have it mean something, as well as having it not be shameful. Because my son who did it worked so hard to do it, and he is very successful and can absolutely get into college, and he's thinking of getting into college. And if you told him in his senior year that he was gonna think about going to college two or years later, he wouldn't have believed you. So we set him up to do the thing that he wants to do now that he got a little older and wiser. Um, we still did all of that, and he was really successful out of the gate doing the thing he loves coming from our schools. So, you know, I feel good about most of what we have. It's just like that making sure that it feels right because I, I've heard the same thing about us just getting kids through and I do know that there are some there is a, a healthy dose of people in our community who feel like our diplomas don't mean anything these days and our teachers feel like I have pressure to pass these kids I've heard that thing about I'm passing kids who aren't in class meanwhile I also have you know a, um, a kid who's struggling with attendance and that the thing we need to worry about with the attendance is different, right? Like us adults need to think about the equity piece of why do we have a student who's not going to class? Because even the ones who seem like clackers aren't. There's a reason that they're not going. There's an equity to it. There's a reason that they've checked out or feel like it could be checked out on them. And um, often by the time somebody is a junior or senior and they're really getting the information on what you need to do in the last couple of years, they're struggling to do it. Um, I feel like we have a lot of really good pieces. It's just that like not everybody is using them in the same way. And that is tough for us, right? And, and I, 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 um, I worry about the fact that like so we're chasing kids trying to get them the, the thing at the last minute the way that we are. So I'm glad that we're talking about like how are we looking at the data more proactively and how can we do that even better all the time? Because I don't want anybody to be surprised by any of the stuff that's happening. And we're big, we're a big system. Of course it's gonna happen like that if we don't put stuff in place. So thanks for everything. I just, whew, it's big. Alexandra. I have this wait. So I'll, I'll wait till the end and see. Oh, other people say. Okay. I don't have anything more I want to add. So I do. Yeah. Okay. I, when I looked at the information, uh, which included credit requirements of nearby districts, what I noticed is the lowest minimum is 22. And I wonder why ours is 20. And I completely heard what you said. But if it's such a good idea that we have a 20 credit diploma, why do no <coughs> other districts in our area offer this as an opportunity? I know very often when we compare ourselves, we compare ourselves with St. <coughs> Vrain. The minimum is 24.5. Poudre is 24. And so, as I said, although I completely heard what you said, why don't other districts also believe that? Is it because they don't need it? <laughs> and I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm interested I'll offer in... You a thought. Uh, I'll offer you a thought all right. to that question. I, I think it goes back to the, what the Thompson 
to Life Committee decided that they wanted to have. And I don't know back then if the Thompson to Life Committee cared what other, stu other stu districts were doing or compared themselves to what other districts were doing um, and, and got those answers. But for whatever reason, back in 2016, decided the 20 credit diploma was a value they wanted to have for Thompson School District, and it was it's certainly unique. Yeah, I'll add a little bit more to this. <coughs> it is unique, so it goes back to 2016 because I did wonder how long, how yes. long that happened. So, so I'll add a little bit more too, and I, and I think Thompson was being divergent in their thinking during that time period because there's another thing too that's a caveat. Like none of these districts have three diplomas either. So, so like when I think about it overall, I think that we kind of saw it in our system for students that needed um, an opportunity to still show they can get their high school diploma and they can challenge their themselves throughout whatever dilemmas or traumas or trials that are happening through their life to access that 20 credit diploma. But when I look at this grid here, that's a good question, Stu, to bring up like, why is we're literally the lowest when you look at the sheet here when you see a lot of 22s, 23s and 24s? And in being here seven years now, I'm a believer that our kids could do 22 or 24 if we made that decision through a committee and came up with that idea. So so just from seeing what we've been able to accomplish, but I'll also tell you some of these school districts have reached out to us too to ask, specifically our neighbor up north, asked, does this still allow kids to get to the NCAA? Because as we're looking at our requirements, mm -hmm. we want to think about if that's something we need to do in our district. So not saying they're going to do that, but they did reach out to me for that level of understanding. Theo, do you know how many students who graduate with twenty cred with a twenty credit diploma actually have at least twenty two credits? So have we're still working on that on data. That? So I will tell you, Evan Ferguson know that. is going to try to get that data pulled for us within the next week. Okay, he's a part of I'd our. I'd be very interested to know that. Support information systems yeah. okay. for his department. Okay. 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 Okay.
because then it's not less, it's different. And whatever those things are, and I get like the 22 question, thank you for bringing that up too, because I, I, I stuck with the 20 only because I saw what the struggle was. And I, and even though that was during COVID, I feel like there are still students who are feeling that way. And we're gonna, we know that when we look at a lot of our academic stuff. Um, I also think about like every conversation we have, regardless of what the topic is that's presented to us, is part of us like putting meaning behind this and making sure that we're supporting people and doing the professional development and the practices and the day in and the day out and the, all of that matters because what we adults do is what's ultimately going to set the students up for the best success, right? And so there are things that we're putting into practice, we're talking about every time that students today didn't have access to because we're getting better at it right now. And that's where my some of my heartache is as well, is that like, we're still working on some of setting everybody up for success in order to put in, like, I guess I felt, it, like, if I could confidently say every student could get that 24 things, I, the day that I feel like that's true, I'm all for it. And I want that. And, I, you know, like, it's not lowering the expectations so much as making sure that we've done the thing to make sure that the students can do what they need to do. And that's where my heartache is with some of this. Okay. Any other questions? All right.
Tyler Schlegel and Carrie Bartman, among others, as we continue to just really forge this path forward for what we're going to do with IKF moving forward. So, uh, to that end, uh, Tiffany and I have designed a little activity for us to do. And so what we're going to do is, I'd like to just lead us in these questions. And, and some of these have kind of already been answered a little bit. So please know that we've, we've documented what you've said. So we don't necessarily need to repeat. But if there are other things that you as a board would like to share around our current IKF policy, we would love to hear what those celebrations are because that will help guide conversations around what is a non-negotiable for us. What do we have to ensure remains as we make revisions to IKF moving forward? So I'll, I'll open the table. This is certainly just open dialogue. Um, if there are things that you, we've heard 20 credit diploma, we've heard other things that are you know, of value to you as a board, but what might be some other things that you appreciate as you've heard some of this information this evening. I um, would like to know where we go with and the impact of our TCC program mm -hmm. and the impact of the <coughs> pathways and how that affects graduation. Is it increasing? Is it changing? That kind of thing. Great. That's good. Great. The rest of you just should, when you're ready, have an idea put it out there. I'm not going to control this. I'd like to know the graduation rates in the districts that have the higher number of requirements. We, we often talk about our own graduation rate. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested to know how it compares with the districts that have 24, 25 and a half, or 22. Sure. For me, that would help to inform whether I would actually advocate to increase um, graduation requirements. That would be part of my decision making. So I appreciate That's having that. Yeah. yeah, we can absolutely do that. Well, I, if it's at all possible, like how many of our students end up going to post secondary ed and very mm -hmm. remedial classes? So they're having to redo stuff. extend on like um, I don't know when I just heard you say this it feels like maybe yesterday but that can't be true um, you were talking about the data we have for post-secondary mm -hmm. the matriculation rate yeah, yeah. It, it, you know and the fact that there we want to have like more better understanding yeah. of that and everything yeah. Yeah. I absolutely want my hands on that because I feel like that's a treasure trove for this conversation <laughs> right like what is it that <laughs> students are really experiencing when they leave here. What is it that they go, oh my gosh, no one told me I needed to know that, right? Because right? I've heard that, by the way, about all sorts of things. And I'm like, I know you actually did learn that. Did you pay attention to it? Right. <laughs> yeah. What else? What are things that you value or appreciate? So I think sort of in relation to what Denise was talking about before is the question about is it the expectation that kids will be in high school for four years. Um, because I think, I mean, I have I have one kid who graduated last year who was pretty much checked out the entire senior year um, and was, had to do a few credits, was doing the, you know, the IT apprenticeship program, which, you know, was a great opportunity, but also I felt like was maybe not enough sort of structure and focus to, to keep her where I thought she should be. Um, and it was it was it was a tough a tough year getting you know getting her through. I now have another kid who at the end of his sophomore year has 17 credits already. And so will need you know seven more credits over two years and is and is talking you know, and now is at the beginning of his junior year is talking about, you know, I think I'm gonna, I wanna finish middle of junior year. And I, I you know, I, 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 he can, he's, you know, if he, ha he has the credits, but I feel like when I went to school, yeah. that wasn't a thing. You went, you went 
for four years, I have no idea how many credits I had, but you just did it. It was just, you, you started as a freshman and you finished at the end of your senior year and that was that. Um, and so I think there are, you know, a lot of, a lot of kids in addition to my two who the senior year becomes just a, you know, yeah. a, a whatever. Yeah. And I and I don't think that um, is valuable to them or to the school district or to society as a whole. Um, yeah, and so that is something I think is important to look at. Is even though a kid can graduate, you know, I mean, my kid will have 24 credits at the end of his junior year. He'll need, I think, like like Denise, he'll need one English class, and that's it. So even though that's you know, required, how how do we make it an expectation that kids are in school for four years? I think Mark is experiencing some of this right now as well. My daughter, uh, so September 30th, she got her first college admittance. Oh, so yeah. she's now admitted to college. Yeah. She's like, why am I still? Yeah. yeah. And so I think, <laughs> you know, why? Yeah. Because I'm here. I'm here. We'll go to class. <laughs> But similar philosophy, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. My, my experience was yeah. four years, and there's a she's taking a lot of concurrent enrollment and getting college credits, and why not? I mean, yeah. so but but I mean, there's a there's not a one size fits all. There's for some there's, yeah. there's, uh, nor should there be. Right. right, and so I think I mean yeah. So I think you know sort of to what Denise was saying and Dawn. I mean I think there needs to be both, but I think there needs to be an emphasis on the kids who are doing good and can graduate and quick how what what's the four year plan for them so they don't check out their senior year. What can we offer them that would allow them to want to stay and what can we do next? I mean here's what here's what you've done and here's where you could go. Which one of these do you want to do? <laughs> Not right. You you can finish or you can keep going. Well, yeah, if we put it that way, but if we come up with a plan, how can we entice them to learn more and be that? And I, knowing I, the I sure cost is part of this, but well, I'm sure we should is, have lots of kids taking advantage of our concurrent. Lots and lots. Yeah, lots. exactly. We need to market that to parents yeah. from the eighth grade and maybe sooner. So it is in legislation that at the spring of the eighth grade year as a district, we actually have to send out all care communication to all eighth grade families. So in legislation that is spelled out, um, we do do that. We work with Ames Community College and Front Range Community College to send out that information. Um, as far as cost, Gordon and I work really close together to give you just a perspective. You know, Pooter School gets $250,000 to teach for their concurrent enrollment kids. My budget this year is a million. So we, we, we're gonna do about 4,000 credits just this fall. Last year I did almost 7,000, or we did almost 7,000 over the whole year of credits. So we continue, I have meetings in the fall and in the spring that just talk about concurrent enrollment, assent, um, to try and get it out there to parents the best we can. Um, but in legislation it is required that we work with our community colleges and send out a requirement to all eighth grade families before they enter that ninth grade year. And then we need counselors who yes. did it hard yes. and teachers that identify kids and say, hey, this would be a really yep. good next step for you. Everybody in the district should be marketing that opportunity. Because our parents are not, across the board, going to be able to afford college. This is a way we can get kids more education, whether it be technical and career education or, you know, a springboard to a four-year degree with you know, minimal effort. I mean, 7,000 credits is great. I mean, don't take yeah, it's no, criticism at all. Yes. No, I don't. It should be three times that. I mean, more and kids need to do it. And, and if I may. Before staying at 24. Right. So one of the challenges that we face as a district around concurrent enrollment is because it is so instructor dependent, mm -hmm. we are trying to brainstorm ways where we can incentivize our staff to become credentialed yeah. to teach concurrent enrollment mm -hmm. and also identifying the reality is transportation is a huge barrier mm -hmm. yeah. and so if I don't have staff at a high school that can teach college math 
And so a student has to drive to the Larimer campus in Fort Collins. And they don't have parents, you know, parents are working full time, so it's up to them to get there. That's, that's a true barrier. Yeah. So how are we addressing that challenge to reduce that barrier and allow our students greater access so that they never have to leave the schoolhouse where we provide transportation every single day? Uh, um, well, in, I mean, the digital options continue yeah, to grow. Yeah. We should absolutely be taking advantage of them. Sure. You know, maybe there's a you know, coordinator in every building. Maybe there is a coordinator in every building that helps you know, with that sort of um, experience for kids yeah. um, and making sure that everything works and the connections are good. And yeah. I don't think anybody is actually suggesting this, but um, I would hope that we would not discourage every kid from finishing high school in three years. There are kids who hate high school. Yes. Yeah. Who, oh, yeah. who need to be out of high school in three years for a whole variety of reasons. Yeah. As I said, I know you, nobody is suggesting that we say no to them, but I'm not sure we want to also send a message of total discouragement for that oh. because many times the reason they want out of high school has nothing to do with academics, and they already have the credits. It's social, it's need to work, it's family problems, whatever it happens to be, so, yeah. yeah. And I would just add as well that, like, so many students who struggle in high school, I mean, we've all heard that story of, like, of people who went on to then go, gosh, I really actually loved it when I did this instead. Yes. And so I think that, like having the adults who are able to help make those connections and not limit students um, and giving them the opportunities and, and filling their time and, and having these be like you know like really meeting the needs of those students that are in front of us is is that best hope right um, because I do think that you know to have that time be meaningful is important Right, like in the end, yeah, right? That's what I mean. And to yeah. and to really say that, like, we we say this is the stuff that we are doing, and we do feel good about the stuff that we are making available. Um, with that in mind, it always crosses my mind to really make sure that we are talking to the to the kids who yes. who leave the system, and right? Whether happy. that's the ones that want to graduate early, um, the ones that drop out, the ones that go to Ferguson. I still say that every student in Ferguson has a story to tell on what we need to do better in our mm -hmm. other yeah. classrooms yeah. all the way right. back to kindergarten, right? Yeah. We need to be interviewing them multiple times to say, how can we make this better from day one of your education? Mm -hmm. Because that's gonna really inform how we do this best. Um, you know, the special education, the, the um, multi-language learners, those are the students where um, I, you know, I think that those are our best opportunities when we find out what it is that's going to help them want to stay in school, what is it that we're doing for them that sets them up to be successful in their life, that's when we're going to have something that, like, meets the needs of everybody. Um, and, and I feel really good about, like, hearing these success stories. And I know that, like, the quantitative data that we have is very, very powerful. You know, I mean, I feel really good about so many of these success stories of, of what our students can do as high schoolers, as recent graduates, as, as they're doing real life. I think that there's some really amazing things that are coming out of our schools that I'm really, really proud of. Yes. If I, th if I could off, sorry, yeah. one more. <laughs> I do think, and I don't know, we need to give them some very practical skills as well. Learning about money, money management. And particularly in this new digital space, there are a lot of parents that they can't just say, you know, here's how you write a check. Yeah, um, right, you know, right. <laughs> and, you know, setting up accounts and yeah. what it takes to get an apartment and um, or feed yourself. We're missing a lot of those opportunities. How to stay safe from cyber criminals. You know, you can teach in one class, but like living in a digital age presents all sorts of challenges and opportunities. And 
you know, they're digital natives, we're not, but I think you can't, it, they need to have some skills yeah. <laughs> that allow them to live independently. And so when I talk to students, they ask about that. Like, mm -hmm. no matter yeah. which high school I go to, when I talk to students, they ask how can we have more of a financial mm -hmm. literacy type of understanding, yes. and okay. how can we build that into our classes. Absolutely. And I think what Denise how is talking about is not career skills, you're talking about life skills. Life skills. Yeah. Yeah. They are two yeah. different things. Yeah. Career yeah. skills and life skills. You get your first paycheck. So I think that's what, what does all of this mean? Yeah. Yeah. Why would you start a 401k? <laughs> My daughter's like, she got promoted, so now she can get a 401k at work. And I'm like, oh, that is such great news. No, they're going to take more of my money. <laughs> oh, and, you know, and sure. so it was, I'm like, oh, my. and I've, I talk finance all the time at home. And still, that was her takeaway was I'm going to get less money. Yeah. And yeah. so having people understand um, all these things, just be on the, the check, the cash you get to spend, um, how they can have better money skills so that they're not going to payday lenders or, or whatever it is that, you know, holds them back because, you know, financial knowledge is not something we have ever really taught well. And it's more and more important as money and using your money. Couponing. Who knew that people didn't, I mean, I didn't know people didn't know how to do that, but they don't. Why wouldn't you vote your student card or whatever? Um, so they can save money. There's a, a whole set of skills that they just don't have and we don't teach okay we we can agree that this is a, an important yeah. necessary topic Good. and I think we can also agree that um, a high school diploma at minimum is a gateway to you know post-secondary options whether it's college or career or what have you um, it's interesting because um, you know I, I, let me also say that I think we could agree that there, there, there shouldn't be a one-size-fits-all, and I, I would say every school district, including ours, has options for students, which I think is important. One of our, one of our goals, uh, among many, is to um, disrupt, I think, um, institutional barriers that a lot of our students currently face. Uh, generational poverty, um, maybe first generation to actually either graduate high school or college, uh, teaching life skills, career skills, community skills, social skills, all those other pieces. And it's incumbent on us from pre-K, early childhood through 12th grade, to provide an array of, of experiences, opportunities, classes, um, both practical and, and, and also theoretical and rigorous and all those other pieces to, to get to get kids ready, and my fear is that um, I I don't want high school necessarily to be a sprint or a race just to finish it, and I don't I don't necessarily hear anyone saying that. So on the one hand, while I think it's really important that we create um, options that will fit the student needs, um, I also think we have to be able to counsel and help guide students with at least making informed decisions. So, and, and I don't really hear anything to the counter, but I just, um, I, I just wanna be mindful that for many students, this is, you know, you get one shot at education, really, early childhood through 12th grade, and I want it to matter. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, those are just, I'm not sure how. Okay, absolutely. Meaning yeah. it matter. If it takes something away from it, it's not just that they have to show up. Yeah. Um, that they actually, leave every class and it's always like oh I'll never use this well you never know actually yeah. and it's that discipline of going to class and accomplishing all milestones as part of this that ultimately will make them successful later but we don't I don't know if we talk big picture or not how it all comes together well I think you know one of the things that I feel has been an undercurrent and a lot of things we've talked about is the role of of just helping people understand, right? And it's a constant thing, right? Communication, like, it's a constant challenge. And and I think about that in so many different pieces that we've talked about today where it's like, I know that it, there 
are things that we're teaching, but if we're teaching it in a classroom setting and it's academic and, and it's, it's not yet connected to the reality, that's part of why students aren't getting it until, you know, then they don't realize they got it. We all did it too, right? Um, and I wonder if, if there's something we can do, especially that senior and junior year as we're talking about having those ex the extra time for a lot of students of, of like mentoring and coaching and it doesn't has to have to necessarily be um, specialized skills. There's like so many ways that we could do that, but you know, to actually say, yeah, you know, you, you did learn how you do your taxes, but now let me talk about why and how, right? Like that, that piece that we all need of someone to say, but this is why you need to know it. This is what, how to answer the questions you have. And that could be helping them with what, how are you gonna use all sorts of things. I mean, I wonder if, if some of what we think about doing is, is maybe less about credits and classes and um, resources that we don't have. Um, and maybe fi also thinking about other things that we can be bringing into this experience to help with the real life things that we know students are needing. And also so that they're hearing it different ways from different people because that's when it sticks. Um, and then obviously the families need to hear it too because I am sure that there are several things that I'm like, I didn't know that and I probably should have known that. And I probably did get it in 20 emails that I missed the context of myself. And I pay attention probably a lot compared to a lot of our busy parents. So, um, I wonder if some of what we're talking about here is a little bit softer in how we help people be prepared for this stuff. Other suggestions that you as stakeholders would like us to carry forward? No, not really a suggestion, I just thought of one more question. Um, does LCS determine its own graduation requirements, or do they use our graduation requirements? Do you happen to know what their requirements <coughs> yes. are for graduation? Yes. Yes. Yes, so yes, I do, because I appreciate you giving us your questions, because I looked into that. So they actually developed their own system, and they have a 26-credit diploma and a 28-credit diploma. And those students there, I believe, would take four years of four core courses as well. So but 26 is the minimum? And yes, and a 28. Okay. How many graduates do they have? 20. Okay. That's a good question, too. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. I think their numbers are going to be going up, but I think it has been one of the 20, 24 range, something like that. I believe it was 20 this last term. Because yeah. You paying attention to them? Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just curious. Thank you. You mentioned barriers and logistics. I think that's like going to be critical. I think. Um, every every good option is going to come with challenges to do the good option, mm -hmm. and so for us to all to be just as, um, creative on how we solve those, uh, getting what we want. I mean, I think part of part of how we should design this is for if we had the resources, what would we do, and then figure out Absolutely. how we solve for that. I almost hear another pathway, but it doesn't fit the typical pathway that we think of. But I hear a pathway that's surviving life, or, or a pathway, a pathway that helps um, how to be an adult. <laughs> you know how to do the things you have to do as an adult. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, that's just what I was kind of hearing as we were talking. I don't know how else we'd ever put it in there, but I hear that in our. Yeah. Gosh, it's too bad. Or what could we do? Only so, I know. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's I mean, it's just. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there are programs um, that exist where you t like first generation students uh -huh. end up getting <coughs> things that like, help them figure out how do I do college because nobody can tell me that. We kind of need that, but segmented for a lot of different parts of right. adult life, right? So yeah. I also think like exposing students to what college might look like in career and tech ed because I think about like how our families of origin often are informing that way more than we, like I don't want to be pushing that on my kids, but I have, 
right? My kids know what I taught them. And, and I'd love to have my kids learn more than just what I have to offer them and being able to get the information to say, you know, if, as somebody who's never done that before, here's what you need to know yeah. about all sorts of things. Yeah. I think that this has been a really true picture of what we wanted our um, conversations to be yeah. because it's not just somebody t telling us here. I mean, it's giving us an opportunity to really think and expand. And so I appreciate you guys really looking at it from that point of view and helping us because we really, all of us said at our retreat we wanted to know more about graduation, but we didn't have a lot of background and uh, we, you know, we could see the numbers, but it didn't answer the questions that we had. So I appreciate it. What I'd like to recommend um, is, um, so we'll have staff kind of go forward and engage um, stakeholders um, and then what I would like to do is come back to the board in the late winter, early spring, and, and just kind of pick up on this conversation. We're, there's no predisp predisposition to outcomes. We're not racing to make any no. changes in the, in the near term. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a, we have need for robust conversations at some point. You know, we absolutely want to engage community as well. Parents, they, they absolutely need to be part of this conversation too. Um, I think today creates um, just a little bit more of some feedback and guidance which you've provided, um, and hearing some of the themes that have emerged, and, um, and I think that'll be super helpful, having that lens, if that's okay with the board. No, I, I think that we probably all agree this is where we wanted to go two years ago when we kind of started this process, so yeah, and this is truly a study session because that's what we could do, so thank you. Yeah, and I agree, revisiting in the spring would be great. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Did I did I did everybody get everything shared that yep. they needed to? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, I suppose that's it. All right. I guess I can um, declare our meeting adjourned. <laughs>